Welcome back students. Today we're going to take a look at section 4.3. Before we get started, um, you'll probably notice that I'm using a different uh, background color for the screen. Um, last, I think for the last two sections we looked at our screen being black in the background with a bright colored uh, writing. I'm going to try the opposite this time and feel free to send me uh, any feedback in the comments below. I've been waiting all my life to, to say that. <laughs> Feel free to send me any comments in, in the comment. Send me any, send me comments in the, now I'm screwing it up. Let me know in the com comments below what you prefer. Um, the idea is to, to try to offset my uh, lack of good penmanship by using technology to, to maximize the or minimize the strain on your eyes. So let's with, let's begin with section 4.3. To recap in section 4.2, um, we studied the differential equations of the first form you see on your screen. They are called homogeneous uh, differential equations. More specifically, they're homogeneous constant coefficients. That means all the a's are constants. Constant coefficient linear ordinary differential equations. I think we, we left out the term ordinary, but these are ordinary differential equations as opposed to partial differential equations. Anyways, in 4.3, we generalize the situation a little bit more. We look at the non-homogeneous case. We look at uh, the case where the right-hand side, which is often called the forcing function, so if you hear me referring to the right-hand side as the forcing function, uh, I'm talking about the g of x in your screen. Um, and in this section, we look at the, the case where g of x is, is not zero. And the, it, it, the, um, the lecture is going to look quite complicated in terms of symbols, but the idea is very easy. The, the, um, your author put it very well. The, the basic idea behind the method is, is a trial and error technique using common sense. And once you get used to the method, it, it really flows along uh, intuitively. At least that's my hope for you. It did with me. So let's continue. In this, is, in this section, we assume, though, that specifically that the forcing function, the g of x, is of the form a times e to the rx, or a times cosine bx plus b times cosine bx. Uh, the a and the b's don't all have to be non-zero in this form. You could have just cosines or just sines. Oh, and I just caught a a typo. You could have just cosines or just sines, or you could have both. I'm going to fix my typo here. This is supposed to have both sines and cosines. So let me fix this up. A cosine bx plus b sine bx. And as I was saying, it could have both these functions or just one or the other. And uh, we could also have forcing functions of the form a times x to the k uh, powers of x, where, where the powers are, are whole number powers. They're not like a to x to the one half or ax to the pi power. It's like ax, the powers we see are ax cubed, ax to the fourth, ax, that kind of thing. So monomi monomials. Uh, monomials are the first, or are, are polynomials with one term, and this term would just be the power term. Uh, or the the uh, forcing function could could be sums in in uh, products of these, okay? But not quotients, not quotients of these. Only sums and differences. Um, differences are actually sums of negative numbers, so we don't have to state it separately. Um, so let's um let's develop the method. Let's um let's recall though real briefly from section four point one what the solution to the non homogeneous case. Is expected to be theoretically. We we expect from 4.1, so from 4.1, we expect the solution to the non-homogeneous case to the non-homogeneous case, homogeneous case to be of the form y equals y sub h, the solution to the homogeneous case, that is what we did in 4.2, plus y sub p, and that's where this section takes off, 
where this y sub p is any particular solution to the gen to the differential equation. Any particular solution to the differential equation. And by differential equation, I mean the, the a, a particular solution to the non-homogeneous case. Let's take a little, a quick look at a kind of a warm-up example to to make sure we're all on the same page. Suppose we suppose we consider y double prime equals minus two sine three x, and we can solve this differential equation without using the methods of of this chapter. We just we're just going to integrate twice. I I just want to show you what the the structure of the solution looks like. So if we integrate both sides, we get y prime equals the integral of sine is negative cosine. So we get 2 cosine, oh, 2 thirds. Let me clean this up. We get, let's see, a second here. We get 2 thirds cosine. 3x plus a constant. Oops. Okay, plus a constant, c1. If we integrate again, we get y equals the integral of cosine is sine. So we get 2 ninths sine 3x plus the integral of c1 is c1x plus another constant of integration. And I'm going to rewrite this solution with the um, const the the part of the solution that has the arbitrary constants in it first, separated by the two ninths sine three x. That first uh, portion of the solution, that's the solution to the homogeneous case. That's exactly the home the, the solution to the homogeneous case. There's a really quick verification of that. The homogeneous case would be y double prime not equals negative 2 sine at 3x. It equals 0. You integrate once. You get constant. You get a, a constant integration. You integrate again. You get c1x plus c2. So that's just to reiterate that first, those first two terms form the, the solution to the homogeneous case. It's this portion of the second portion of the solution that we're after in section 4.2. It, this 2, two ninths uh, sine of 3x, this is a particular solution to the differential equation. If you substitute it back into the differential, just differential equation, it will, it will work, and there are no arbitrary constants in it. So to, to recap really quickly, the y sub h that we found was from section four, it was done in section 4.1. Our task is to figure out the general way, or a general way of finding uh, the particular solution to the differential equation. And then we basically combine sections 4.2 and 4.3 to get the general solution of y sub h plus y sub p. So we'll start with an example. Let's start with an example. So here's where the section formally begins. Suppose we want to solve the differential equation y double prime plus 4y equals 5e to the 3x. Okay. The first thing we're going to want to do, and this goes throughout this, this whole lecture, the first thing we're going to want to do is find the, the solution to the homogeneous case. The homogeneous case would be y double prime plus 4y equals 0. And referring back to what we do in section 4.2, we set up the the auxiliary equation or characteristic equation equivalently, lambda squared plus 4, not plus 4 lambda, but lambda squared plus 4 equals 0. This gives us lambda equals plus or minus 2i. And from our work in the previous section, we know that that says that our solution takes on the form c1 uh, times cosine of 2x plus c2 times the sine of 2x. Okay, by the way, if you're looking at this video before doing 
looking at the video on section 4.2, you really ought to stop this video and go back. You can, we can't proceed without mastery of section 4.2. So at, at this point, it's a good idea that you have already uh, watched the video uh, on section 4.2 and or, and would be better, read the textbook and at least started some of the homework from section 4.2. This shouldn't be done in, independently of 4.2. Okay. So let's um let's find the let's find the the particular solution to this differential equation. Now, the particular solution is again any solution, a specific one though doesn't have arbitrary constants. Any solution that will solve the original differential equation with the forcing term, the the five e to the three x. And this is where the, the author's statement about the method really is a method of trial and error using common sense uh, applies. Look at our original differential equation. Look, focus, focus your attention right now on the original problem with the forcing function intact and everything, okay? Let's see if it'll allow me. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So we're looking for a solution to this differential equation. Now, imagine plugging in a function on the left-hand side, taking in two derivatives, adding to that the original function, and then somehow getting 5e to the 3x. What kinds of functions can you take two derivatives of and then add four times the original function to and get uh, 5e to the 3x or anything with e to the 3x in it? Well, common sense says, since the derivative of e to the 3x returns another e to the 3x, times 3, of course, with the, using the chain rule, that it might be logical to assume that y sub p is some constant e to the 3x. This is where the common sense comes in. And our task, and this is basically for the whole the whole section is to to do to, to do two things. One, set up the form that I just uh, set up for you for y sub p in red, and then find the constant find the constant a or constants that will be involved. It's not just one constant in every particular solution. So, let's concentrate now on finding the the const the value of the constant a. So to do that, we're going to substitute our y sub p into the differential equation. So let's take a let's take a couple derivatives of this uh, solution. The derivative of a e to the three x is three a e to the three x. The second derivative we'll need also because our our differential equation is a second order differential equation, and that's going to equal nine e to the three x. Let's substitute it into the differential equation. So plug into the differential equation. And if we do that, the differential equation has y double prime plus 4y on the left-hand side. So y sub p double prime plus 4y sub p. That will equal y sub p double prime is 9a e to the 3x plus 4 times y sub p, which is a e to the 3x. And that has to equal that has to equal whatever is on the right hand side and the right hand side is the forcing function 5e to the 3x and we solve for a solve the resulting equation for a solve for a if possible and if we do things right it'll always be possible okay so let's let's continue this on the left hand side, notice we have 9a e to the 3x plus another 4a e to the 3x. So that gives us a screen that popped up, and it also gives us 13a e to the 3x, and that must equal the 5e e to the 3x on the right hand side. So what does that say? It says that a 13a should equal. 5, it says then a should equal 5 thirteenths. And that ends this, that ends the problem. We have found that the particular, a particular solution to this differential equation 
is 5 thirteenths times e to the 3x. Remember, we were assuming that our particular solution took on the form a e to the 3x, and the a is 5 thirteenths. The only thing left to do is to uh, write the solution to the differential equation and maybe kind of readable symbols here. So <laughs> write the solution. So the solution should be y equals the homo the solution to the homogeneous case plus the solution we just found uh, as a particular solution. So it should be the, the, the general solution was c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine 2x. c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine 2x plus our particular solution 5 thirteenths e to the 3x. That is how this entire section plays out. It's not over, not even, not nearly, and the reason for that is there are, there are general cases that we want to look at. We want to look at, um, the, we want to look at what happens when we have different forcing functions involving exponential, sines, cosines, uh, powers, like I mentioned in the, in the first few minutes, or products of those things, or sums and products of those things. So let's continue on. But the basic idea is, is the same. First you find y sub h, then you find y sub p, the general form of y sub p. Then you substitute y sub p into the differential equation and solve for any unknown constants in y sub p. So let's, uh, if you missed that, let's, let's, uh, let's just continue. Let's just continue on here. So for example, let's take a look at the, another example. Let's see, let's take a look at solving the differential equation, say y double prime plus 4y equals x squared. y double prime plus 4y equals x squared. I kept the, the same left-hand side of the differential equation, but I changed our right-hand side to be uh, a, a power for, our for, for our forcing function. So let's, uh, let's proceed as, as before. We already determined we determined what y sub h was from before, so we don't have to redo that. Um, y sub h is nothing more than c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine of 2x. Again, we already did this. So let's take a look at searching for the particular solution. If we use the r last example as a guide and common sense, we're looking for a particular solution, something we could substitute into the left-hand side of this differential equation, simplify that, and then get x squared out. Well, you notice that the differential equation has 4y on the left-hand side. So it seems logical to make y sub p equal to a times x squared. And that's that's what we'll do is our first attempt okay and there's you can kind of see that that there might be a little something amiss here if I'm since I'm saying this is a first attempt well let's see what happens so if I assume that y sub p has the form a x squared and then I, dif I differentiate to substitute into our differential equation so I'm going to differentiate a couple of times Derivative of ax squared is 2ax. The derivative of 2ax is 2a. And then substitute this back into differential equation, back, back into the left-hand side of uh, the differential equation. Okay. So if I substitute it into the left-hand side, I'm looking at y, pre, y sub p double prime plus 4y sub p. Uh, y sub p double prime is 2a uh, plus 4y sub p. y sub p is ax squared. And that must equal, so we set this equal to, this must equal the right-hand side. And then we try to solve for the constant a to make this work. Well, let's take a look at, at, at what happens when we, when we try to solve this. This can be written, this, uh, the left-hand side can be written as 2a plus 4a squared. 
and somehow this needs to equal x squared, or if you will, 0 plus x squared. The reason I did that is that this equation has to hold true for all x. So, oops, I think I copied this wrong here. So give me a second. It's not 4a squared. It's 4ax squared. Just give me a second. Clean this up. Finally getting used to this pen. Okay, so this, is, this equation is supposed to hold true for all x. So I should be able to set the coefficients of the powers of x equal to each other. In other words, I need to have 4a equal to 1. And I need to also have the constant term on the left-hand side equal to the constant term on the right-hand side. And that gives us a pair of equations that are impossible to solve. It's impossible to solve this, if you will, system of two equations with one unknown. You can't have 4a equaling 1 and 2a equaling 0. That says a should equal 1 fourth. And at the same time, not or, at the and, at the same time, a equals 0. So this is impossible. So something's wrong. Something needs, some adjust, adjustment needs to be made for our uh, particular solution. Notice that when we substitute our particular solution into the differential equation and we differentiate it twice, we get that 2a term. And that's where the problem was. So what we'll do to offset this is we will... We'll assume that y sub p does in fact have an a, an ax squared term in it, but we'll also assume that it has every power beneath it also in the, in the particular solution. Okay, so stop for a second and look what I just did. I'm going to highlight the forcing function on the original differential equation in, let's say, blue. Or let's say green shows up there. Okay, except I, mean, I guess I'm not highlighting the the squared part <laughs> for some reason. Um, the the right hand side needs to have x squared in it after we we substituted the y sub p into it, and that x squared is going to come from y sub p. But the um, the derivatives of the function, if we just had y, if we just substitute y equals ax squared, give us the constant 2a for the second derivative. And there's no way to make that disappear and the x squared disappear, uh, not disappear at the same time. I don't know if that turned out very clear. So um, what we do is we assume that if our forcing function has a particular power in it, that our particular solution also has that power in it. And let's see if I can, this, this uh, pen is going to allow me to change the color it is. Has that particular, that, that same power in it and every power be beneath it. This situation is similar to um, what happened with you when you studied uh, integration by partial fractions. Um, in a particular case, when the denominator was quadratic, you had to assume that the numerator was of degree one, exactly one less. And, and in fact, the numerator had to have the term ax plus b in it. Um, if you don't recall that, it's not essential. I'm just trying to connect this with something maybe you, you remember seeing earlier. In any case, let's, let's make the assumption that we have this adjusted y sub p. And let's see what happens when we try to find the constants a, b, and c. If you take a derivative, you get 2ax plus b. Our differential equation has a couple derivatives in it. Oops. So let's find y sub p double prime. It's 2a. And this goes back into the d differential equation. Okay, so we substitute that back into the differential equation. And what we find then is, let's see, the left-hand side of the differential equation was y double prime plus 4y. So y sub p double prime plus 4y sub p then equals... Uh, 2a, that's our y sub p double prime, 
plus 4 times y sub p, 4 times ax squared plus bx plus c. And that must equal whatever we have on the right-hand side, which was x squared. Now let's see what happens when we try to solve for the constants a, b, and c. I'm going to rearrange the, the terms on the left-hand side to decreasing powers of x. So we have 4ax squared uh, plus 4bx, if I distribute the 4, plus the constant term left is 2a plus c, and that needs to equal x squared, or if you will, 1x squared plus 0x plus 0. So let's equate the coefficients to solve for a, b, and c. So this says that 4a needs to equal 1. 4b, the coefficient of x on the left-hand side, needs to equal 0, the coefficient of x on the right-hand side. Coefficient left-hand side constant, coefficient right-hand side of constant 0. We have a system of three equations and three unknowns. This one's super easy to solve. A equals one fourth, B equals zero, C equals negative two A. I think I've done something wrong here. Yeah, I have to make a little adjustment here. Uh, this would say that C equals negative two A, but rather than stop this video and edit it, and <laughs> I'm going to go back up to and you probably caught the mistake. If you distribute the 4 into ax squared plus bx plus c, you get 4c and not just c. So I'm going to correct this. So this c becomes 4c. This c in the third equation is a quick fix. This makes you look at a little bit longer of a video. Take an extra three hours to download it to YouTube. You know, they don't download very quickly. <laughs> Upload very quickly, rather. So 2a plus 4c equals 0. So correcting the last constant, c equals negative one half a but a was one fourth so this equals negative one eighth and this works out nice so so this tells us that y sub p then equals remember it equals ax squared plus bx plus c a was one fourth one fourth x squared b is 0, so plus 0x, and c is minus 1 eighth. So this is our particular solution. The general solution to the differential equation then is real simple. We've got, we've done all the work. All we need to do is put, pull the stuff together. The general solution is y equals y sub h plus y sub p, oops, 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 plus y sub p, not p sub p. Let's see here y sub p, so y equals y sub h, which is c1 cosine plus two, c2 sine of 2x, so c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine 2x plus r, particular solution that won't have any arbitrary constants in it, 1 fourth x squared minus 1 eighth. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to, um, let's see, I'd like to try another example. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at an example uh, where our, our left-hand side is the same, y double prime plus 4y. But our right-hand side is now a combination of the forcing functions we saw in our first two examples. It has the x squared from our first example, 
part. Let's see, is that our first example? Yeah, no, it has the, the e to the 3x from our first example and an x squared from our second example. Okay, so the, the process is exactly the same. So y sub h we found real early on, c1 cosine 2x plus c2 sine 2x. Now we're faced with finding the form for y sub p. So here's a, a milestone for us. If our differential equation has a product of two types of functions, like a power and an exponential, then to get the particular solution, we simply multiply those the, the particular solutions we would have gotten individually from those things. If you missed that, if we had just had the x squared term in our general in our uh, right hand side, our forcing function, we would assume that our particular solution had the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. If we assume if our if our forcing function only had the e to the three x, we would have assumed that the the y sub p was a e to the three x. Now we have the product of those two things, those two functions. So our y sub p has the product of those two separate y sub p's. Okay, there's nothing more to this. So for, for most of the problems to follow, I'm not going to be finding the constants a, b, and c. I think I'm going to be finding the constants for, it, for at least one more differential equation. But for most of the problems, I'm just going to be asking you for or asking us for in the examples, the form of y sub p, the, what the structure of y, y, should p, y sub p would be. Um, if we were actually solving this problem, we wouldn't be done. We'd need to take y sub p, substitute it into the differential equation, form a system of equations. In this case, there would be a system of three equations and three unknowns, since we have three unknowns. And then we'd go forward with that. And that's a lot of... Um, a lot of sort of grunt work that always results in a system of equations. Now, when you're getting to those systems of equations and solving these problems on the homework, feel free to use the Gauss-Jordan elimination method or uh, any of the methods we, we learned earlier in the course uh, and use your calculator to do it. There's no need for you to waste any time solving systems of equations by, by hand, okay? Okay, so for now, we're looking for most for the most part, just the form of the of the general solution. So we won't find the constants. So let's summarize what we have so far. Um, before I do that, I want to let you know that your I like your textbook sort of. <laughs> now your textbook's okay. Um, your author summarizes all of this this entire section in a in a theorem theorem four point eleven, and it's very difficult to read. 4 theorem 4.11, um, you could actually uh, get through this section without studying section 4.11 by just looking at my summaries along the way as I go through the lecture. Um, 4.11 covers it. It's just very difficult to read because he covers every case in a short a couple of short paragraphs and, and it's kind of rough to kind of rough reading okay so let me give you the summary let me give you a summary so far let me uh change to a different colored pen and so let's see a summary of this so far okay let's um let's assume assume that the right hand side that forcing function that I'm referring to, forcing function, that the right-hand side is of the form some constant times x to the k um, e to the r x. Okay, where r is not a root of the auxiliary polynomial for the homogeneous case. 
Okay, this is this is a this little last little bit is very very important. That in the forcing function, the exponential term and the power term don't correspond to y sub h at all. They don't correspond to the solution to the to the um, to the auxiliary equation. If this doesn't make sense right now, just let it go temporarily. Let's just go back to our assumption that the um, right hand side has a combination or, or the product of the of the power and the exponential term. So the summary is really quite beautiful. The summary says that y sub h will have the, y, I'm sorry, y sub p, it's beautiful when you write the right things, but the opposite when you write the wrong things. Give me a second here. Okay, so uh, y sub, oops, grief. Sorry about that. Y sub p then is how we would form y sub p for just the power. That means we would assume some constant times that power plus another constant times a power just before that all the way down to the constant term plus a zero. That's what we would assume for y sub p if we just had the power. In our in our previous problem, the it, the y sub p was x squared, so we'd assumed a x squared plus b x plus c. If it has the e to the r x as a, as uh, multiplied by that power, we assume that y sub p also contains that factor uh, in its in its form. Okay, the bottom line is we we uh, we look at the what we would assume for y sub p for the power, what we would assume for y sub p for the exponential term, and then multiply both those things together. This is this is very very um, simple actually. <laughs> okay, um, if if uh, if not, just digest it a little bit at a time. Let's um let's move forward. Let's see. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at. Oh, give me a second here. Let's change our let's change our uh, differential equation a bit. So suppose we want to solve the differential equation y double prime minus three y prime equals seven times the sine of x. All right. So. In this case, the forcing function is not of the form in the summary. It has a trig function in it. So the our general, our not general solution, our particular solution should not look like that one I just wrote for the for the um, forcing function being a power times an exponential function. So let's um let's proceed with with this. Um, first, we find the solution to the homogeneous case. The auxiliary equation is y squared, or lambda squared, minus 3 lambda equals 0. Factoring, it gives us lambda times lambda minus 3 equals 0. So the homogeneous solution is, uh, since lambda equals 0 is one solution, we get c1 e to the 0x. Lambda equals 3 is our second solution, so plus c2 e to the 3x. This was what we did in, in section uh, 4.2. Okay, so now let's try to find our particular solution. <coughs> Excuse me. So, let's try our for our particular solution. Excuse me again. Let's try to make the assumption that our particular solution looks like our forcing function. It seems like a logical choice. It seems like a logical choice because we're trying to find a particular solution such that when you take derivatives of this and this particular solution, substitute it into the left-hand side of the differential equation, we get signs. We get seven signs specifically. Well, 
Um, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens if we make the assumption that it should be then some, some multiple of sine of x. So if we take the first derivative, we get a cosine x. If we take the second derivative of our particular solution, we get negative a sine x. And substitute this back into the differential equation. So back into the differential equation. Okay, our differential equation on the left-hand side said had y double prime minus 3y prime, so y sub p double prime minus 3y sub p prime equals y double prime is negative a sine x uh, minus 3 times y sub p prime. y sub p prime is a cosine x and that must equal the forcing function, what we have on the right-hand side. And again, this is impossible. This is not possible to solve for a. If you're not sure about that, let's try to solve for a. This says that simultaneously, I'll make sure I did this right, that looks good. Yeah. Yeah, simultaneously, we need the coefficient of sine on the left, negative a to equal 7, and the coefficient of cosine on the left, negative 3a, to equal the, co the coefficient of cosine on the right, which is 0. On the right, we could imagine adding 0 cosine x. And this is, again, an impossible situation. Impossible. So what went wrong? What's the problem? The problem is, um, while it's true that if we assume that our solution has sine in it, the derivatives return signs occasionally, but they also return cosines. And our right-hand side can only have a sine in it. So in order to have a hope of, of not having a cosine left when we make a substitution, of our particular solution into the differential equation, we assume that our particular solution has that sign in it, that, that uh, the original sign that was in our differential equation, but also has a cosine in it. So we assume that the particular solution looks like a cosine x plus b times sine x and then hope to find the constants a and b. Let's try to find the constants a and b. So y sub p prime equals negative a sine x plus b cosine x. y sub p double prime equals negative a cosine x minus b sine x. And we substitute this back into the differential equation. Back into the differential equation. So we're going to get y sub p double prime minus 3 y sub p prime. That's the left-hand side of our differential equation. Negative a cosine x minus b sine x minus 3 times y sub p prime. y sub p prime is minus a sine x plus b cosine x. And that has to equal, when all the dust settles on the left-hand side, that has to equal our 7 sine x. I'm trying to rewrite that a little neater. 7 sine x that's on the right hand side. So now let's equate coefficients. Well, we kind of have a mess on the left hand side. So let's let's clean up the let's maybe clean up the the left hand side. Let's um let's gather the sines and cosines together. On the left we have a negative a cosine and if we distribute the negative 3 into the in through the third term there we get minus 3b so that's our coefficient 
of the cosine plus, and then gather the coefficients of sine, negative b, and then if we distribute the negative 3n, so plus 3a times sine of x, and that has to equal 7 sine x, or if you will, 0 cosine x plus 7 sine x. And I just inserted the 0 cosine x just, just so that we can equate coefficients on each side. So if we equate coefficients on each side, we have negative a minus 3b equals 0. That's what we get by setting the coefficients of cosine equal to each other. And if we set the coefficients of sine equal to each other, we get, uh, I'm going to rewrite that as 3a minus b instead of negative b plus 3a equals 7. We have a system of two equations and two unknowns. Okay, I'm not going to solve the system online here. It's a very simple system. I actually verified the solution, so you can sort of trust me on this. Or you could solve it if you want, if you don't trust me. Wouldn't blame you. So A equals 21 over 10. B equals negative 7 tenths. You don't need to use any fancy techniques. Just maybe substitution or whatever. Um, so our particular solution then takes on the form. Remember what our solution was. It, our particular solution was of the form a cosine plus b sine of x. So our particular solution then looks like a 21 over 10 cosine x plus b, so minus 7, oops, 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 <clears throat> minus 7 tenths sine x. That's our particular solution. If we were looking for the general solution, which is what we were looking for, <laughs> So the general solution is very simple to state now. General solution is y sub h plus y sub p. You don't have to state that every time. Uh, y sub h was way back here. I already forgot what y sub h was. Uh, C1 plus C2 e to the 3x. So C1, let's see here, plus C2 e to the 3x. Yeah. Sorry about jumping around like that. Plus a y sub p 21 over 10 cosine x minus 7 tenths sine x. Okay. So let's summarize this little bit of information or this chunk of information so far. <clears throat> so to summarize, let's um, let's do this. Let's summarize again a different color. Oops. And summarize in red. Summary. A summary since our last summary. Okay, suppose our uh, right hand side, our forcing function, has Let's see, either C times the sine of BX or D times the cosine of BX or both. Yeah, or, or, or both uh, C sine X plus D cosine BX. Okay, it doesn't have to have one, doesn't have to have both, one or the other or both. So if our... If our right hand side, or if our forcing function has, has these two, and again, I'm going to be making a statement here that may seem a little foreign. It won't in a, in a, in a little bit. We're assuming in, in this that R equals, and let's, let me do this. Uh, we're assuming that. Um, I'm going to say this, plus or minus I, B are not roots of our 
uh, auxiliary equation for the homogeneous case. Okay, so we're assuming that the right-hand side, the forcing function, doesn't look like the, the uh, solution to y sub uh, to the homogeneous case. It doesn't look like y sub h. Um, if again, just like our last summary, if this isn't clear, just concentrate on what the the right hand side we're assuming about the right hand side. We're assuming that the right hand side has either uh, sines or cosines of bx. All right. So if that's the case, then we can go directly to y sub p. Then y sub p will have the form. Uh, it will if if it has either sine or cosine y sub p will have both sines and cosines y sub p will look like some a cosine bx plus b sine bx it's important for you to understand though again that the right hand side doesn't have to have both sine and cosine in it but the y sub p or assumption about y sub p is that it has both sine and cosine. It may turn out that that the a or the b, one of the two, is zero, but not generally the case. Okay. Okay. So while we're summarizing, let's let's see here. While we're summarizing, let's assume that our right hand side is maybe the product of powers and sines and cosines. Okay, let's cover a little more real estate here. Suppose that the right-hand side uh, has um, a C. Let's see how I want to write this. Suppose the right-hand side has a power C x to the k sine B x or dx to the k cosine bx or the sum of both of these okay again we're making the solution or the the assumption here that none of our none of the um the uh forcing function occurs in any of y sub h and if that if that doesn't make sense just let let that part go so let's assume that we're we attack on the a possibility of having a power uh, multiplied by the sine or cosine. The, the outcome for y sub p is the same thing as in our previous summary. We assume that our particular solution then is the product of the, of the particular solutions that we would have if we only had the power or if we only had the trig function. If that doesn't make sense, we assume that the, the particular solution has the form a sub k x to the k from the power plus every power below it down to the zero power, down to the constant term, k minus 1 plus dot 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 all the way down to a sub 1 x plus a sub 0 times cosine of bx plus um, b sub k x to the k plus b sub k minus 1 x to the k minus 1 plus dot 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 plus b1 x plus b0 times the sine of bx. Okay. Let's take a look at our next example. So, for example, um, for this example, and pretty much for the rest of the examples, um, well, for this example, I'm just interested in finding the form of y sub p without finding the actual constants. So, let's consider the the directions altered a little bit. Find the form for y sub p. And all this means is that we're going to find y sub p without actually substituting the y sub p back into the differential equation. 
Okay, so we're eliminating the, the case that where we need to look at uh, setting up the system, setting up a system of, of equations and, and solving the system. So let's say our differential equation looks like y double prime minus 2y prime plus 2y equals 4x squared sine of x. All right, so as with all of these cases, we find y sub h first. Set up the auxiliary polynomial lambda squared minus 2, uh, 2 lambda uh, plus 2 equals 0. Set up the auxiliary equation. This equation doesn't factor, so we use a quadratic formula. So lambda equals, using the quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And this gives us 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 over 2, or 2 plus or minus 2i over 2, or 1 plus or minus i. So remember from section 4.2 that that gives us that our homogeneous solution, the solution is a homogeneous case, is e to the x from the real the real part of this times c1 cosine uh, of x from the imaginary part of the of the solutions to the or the roots of the auxiliary equation and we're also going to get an e to the x times a c2 times a c2 sine x so we'll combine that idea into maybe factoring out the e to the x. So from section 4.2, there's a solution to the homogeneous case. And from our summary, from our summary, then we notice, take a look at, or, or focus now on what the uh, forcing function looks like. Focus on the forcing function. Takes on the form, let's see, Four it is of the form it is actually equal to four x squared sine of x. So our summary says, our summary says that if our the right hand side of our our differential equation has powers multiplied by sines or cosines, that the corresponding particular solution has powers multiplied by sines and cosines has both. So our particular solution then, oops, our particular solution is going to have the form ax squared plus bx plus c, since the, the forcing function had x squared in it, times cosine x plus dx squared plus ex plus f times sine. Now notice that in our in the summary I used subscripted uh, variables and here I'm just using a through f. It doesn't matter. They're going those are the constants that need to be determined. What we use for them is not important. If if that bothers you you could also write it. It really makes no difference whatsoever. You could write this as a1x squared plus a2. I guess that's not the way I'm doing it. I did it in the... No, let me redo that. Let me see. Okay, so... Or y sub p has the form a2x squared plus a1x plus a0 cosine plus b2x squared plus b1x plus b0 sine. Not important, the, what we call our, our, our coefficients. By the way, so I haven't mentioned the name of the method. 
right now would be a perfect time to say it. Actually, a perfect time would have to say it would be at the beginning of the video. Um, the, the method is called the method of undetermined coefficients. And what we would do from to finish this problem is we would determine the values of A, B, C, D, E, and F to to solve this solution to solve this problem. So that's why the that's why the, the thing is called undetermined method is called undetermined coefficients. So next I'd like to 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 take a look at the possibility that we have all three of the types of functions of powers exponentials and trig functions in our problem. So for our next example, so find the form for y sub p if our differential equation now has the same has the same left hand side as the previous example. y double prime minus 2y prime plus 2y on the left hand side and on the right hand side we have the 4x squared like we had before but we now have an e to the minus x and, and an assign x this is not going to be a big leap for us <clears throat> y sub c, y sub h we found before already found above y sub p then will have all three uh, functions in its form it will have a2x squared plus a1x plus a0 from the x squared term. It will have e to the minus x from the e to the minus x factor. And it will have cosine from the fact that we have a trig function. But we could possibly also have a term with, with the same form, the same structure, but with signs e to the minus x sine x okay so let's let's summarize this and perhaps if you haven't after we've summarized this perhaps take a take a little break in the video before we look at the our next we go around our next corner so let's summarize again what if our forcing function has the product of all three types of uh, individual forcing functions. So let's take a look at the, the let's uh, write this as a summary. Let's take a look at the summary. If our forcing function has the form, let's say, how do I want to write this? Let's say C x to the k e to the a x uh, sine uh, actually doesn't matter which one we put first I want to be consistent with my own like notes though cosine doesn't matter what which way we write first cosine dx or dx to the k e to the a x sine bx or possibly the sum of these two okay I would imagine that that you've guessed what the particular solution would look like but i gotta put that strange little caveat in here so it's where where a plus or minus b i um are not roots of the auxiliary equation for our homogeneous uh, the homogeneous uh, equation okay okay again just as I said a couple times earlier if this last bit doesn't make sense just focus on what if our forcing function has the product of all three uh, individual types of forcing functions this is a simple summary this is a very simple summary we assume that y sub h then has the product of all three um, y sub oops not y sub h y sub p has the product of all three um, particular solutions types of particular solutions that we had before if that didn't make sense it's all right 
So we assume that y sub p then has powers. The highest power in y sub p will be the same power that's in y sub h. But that will also, it will also include all, potentially, all the powers below. I mean, potentially, it may turn out that, the, the, that it only has the x to the k. But it could turn out that it has uh, one or more of all the powers below it. So it's a1x plus a0. If our right-hand side has an x to the k, there's, there's the corresponding power in our particular solution. If it has e to the ax, it'll, our particular solution will have e to the ax. If it has cosine of bx or sine of bx, the particular solution will have potentially both. So it will have the cosine term and potentially the sine term with the same structure. So the k minus 1 plus dot 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 plus b1x plus b0 e to the ax sine bx. Okay. So as I mentioned, if you um if you're a little weary and you want to break, then stop the video. When you restart the video, we'll be looking at um our last potential problem with with this method for just to, to to give you something to think about for all of these cases we've looked at so far none of the 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 solution to the homogeneous equation none of the none of the solution was any part of the forcing function when that occurs we have a little bit of a problem and it really is a little bit of a problem it it, it looks like like most anything else that's written out in math the the it looks it looks more complicated than it is, but it's not so bad. So we'll proceed with our last case in a break after a break. All right, let's finish up this section. We have we have one more obstacle to consider here. I'm putting a line through here um, because this this is um, this is a uh, this part of the section. There's a problem occurs that didn't happen in any of the previous examples. So let's um let's just dig in with a let's dig in with a um, an example. So suppose I want to solve a differential equation um, y double prime minus four y equals 7e to the 2x. So let's proceed as before. The first thing we do is we look for uh, the solution to the homogeneous case. So um, we set up the auxiliary equation lambda squared minus 4 equals 0. So lambda equals plus or minus 2. So our homogeneous solution y sub h is c1 e to the 2x plus c2 e to the minus 2x just as we did dozens of times in section 4.2 okay now this looks this looks exactly the same without looking in more carefully or it looks exactly the same as a, a as the kind of problems we looked at before there's a big difference, though. Um, let's try to find y sub p. Let's say y sub p. If we just go go by what we said in the last hour, um, y sub p, since the forcing function has e to the 2x and no, no extra powers or no sines or cosines, we would suspect that y sub p, let's say, y sub p usual. This, this is not terminology your, your author uses. U y sub p usual would be a e to the 2x. That's what we would have done in the last hour. This can't work. This cannot possibly work. Okay. And I want you to have that in your notes if you're taking notes. This can't work. 
This can't possibly work. Why not? Think about it for just a minute. If y sub p has the form a e to the 2x, and you substitute y sub p back into the differential equation, what's always going to happen? Now, if you haven't figured it out, look at y sub h and look at y sub p. y sub h contains c1 e to the 2x. y sub h has c1 e to the 2x in it. That's exactly the form of what we're assuming to be y sub p. So no matter what we do, no matter what, when we substitute y sub p into the differential equation, we're, there's no way we're going to get 7e e to the 2x. We're always going to get 0. If, if you're still not on board with this, try it. Try substitute. Let's try to substitute. Um, in fact, we'll keep it in green ink. Let's try to substitute y sub p equals a equal to 2x, a e to the 2x back into our differential equation. So y sub p prime will equal 2a e to the 2x. y sub p double prime will equal 4a e to the 2x. So substituting this back into the differential equation, back into our differential equation, we get y sub p double prime minus 4y sub p will equal 4a e to the 2x, that's y sub p double the prime, minus 4 times y sub, uh, y sub p, 4a e to the 2x, that's 0. And that's not, not good. Somehow this is supposed to equal 7e to the 2x. That's just not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So now this, um, this dilemma is really a small dilemma. It's really a small part. Most of the work from this section is, is done. All we need to do is to adjust this uh, form of y sub p from before to accommodate the fact that it's part of y sub h. And we simply do that by multiplying by y sub p, the usual form, by some power of x. And the power of x is very simple to, to predict. The simplest way, the simplest way to adjust uh, y sub p is to do this. Let me clean that up a little bit. To adjust y sub p is to simply take y sub p and multiply it by x. To take y sub p as I found above and multiply it by x. Now, when we substitute this adjusted version of y sub p into our differential equation, since it's not related to, since no part of this is any part of y sub h, we can possibly solve, we can exactly solve for the constant missing constant a. Okay, I'm not going to do it. This is the form of y sub p. To find a, we would do the same thing as we did before. We would substitute y sub p back into the differential equation and solve for a. The, the really, the, the thrust of this part of our lecture, our last part of our lecture, is how do we adjust y sub p that we would have had before, our usual y sub p, if the forcing function is contained in part of our of our homogeneous solution. Okay, so let's take a look at let's take a look at another example here, and then we'll then we'll summarize this business. So um, our sec our next example looks like this. So our next example S set up the form for y sub p, and the differential equation looks like y double prime plus 2y prime plus 2y, same left-hand side as we had a couple of examples ago, 
equals the same parsing function we had a little while ago. 4x squared e to the minus x sine x. The big difference from the example er, from an example earlier is right here. I changed this plus or this minus from a previous example to a plus, and it's going to have every effect in the world here. <laughs> okay, so let's find y sub h. Y sub h we solve what we find by setting up and solving the auxiliary equation. So lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 2 equals 0. The quadratic formula is necessary here, just like it was in a couple of examples ago. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared. Uh, 2 squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Or negative 2 plus or minus the square root of um, negative 4 again, just like in our previous example, or 2. Or negative 2 plus or minus 2i over 2. Or negative 1 plus or minus i. As opposed to 1 plus or minus i a couple of, two a couple of sec um, examples ago. So y sub h, simply by using our method from 4.2. The, the uh, real part corresponds to um, the exponential term, so e to the, the exponential factor, e to the minus x. The, the complex or the re imaginary part corresponds to sines and cosines, to c1 cosine x plus c2 sine of x. Okay. Now, let's find y sub p y sub p. What we did before is we assumed, and I'm going to, so I'm going to call this y sub p usual. Usual? I'm going to spell usual correctly. I'm going to spell usual in the usual way. So y sub p usual was, um, well, or look at our forcing function. How we set up, how we set it up, y sub p in the usual ways. We looked at the structure of our forcing function. Our forcing function had power, exponential, and sines and cosines, and just sines. So we we set up, and this is just what we did before. We set up our y sub p to have a power, a sub k, x to the k plus a sub k minus one, x to the k minus one plus all the way down to the constant term, so a sub k, oops, 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 not a sub k, a sub 1, x plus a sub 0. It, it has the exponential factor, and it has cosines, and we also have plus um, the same structure, but with a sine function, so bx to the k, b sub k minus 1, x to the k minus 1, plus all the way down to b sub 1, x plus b sub 0, the exponential, and a sign. Okay, this can't work. This can't work because some of this y sub p, some of this y sub p is, con is contained in y sub h. Look at what I'm, oops, what I'm kind of identifying here in green. Look at that part of y sub p. That part of y sub p, the a sub 0 e to the minus x cosine plus the b sub 0 e to the minus x sine, that is exactly y sub h. We can't have any part of y sub p be any part of y sub h. Because whatever we, whenever we substitute y sub h into our differential equation, we're going to get 0, regardless of the constants a sub 0 and b sub 0 and y sub h here. Okay? The simplest way to adjust that is by multiplying by a 
by an appropriate power of x. Multiply the whole y sub p usual by an appropriate power of x. Now here's the key. The power of x that we multiply by y sub p usual by is the smallest power so that after I multiply by that power, none of the y sub p is any of the y sub h. That's kind of a huge concept here, and I'll, I'll repeat that at the very end. So we form y sub p then as x times y sub p usual. And just so you have it on your notes, it's then x times this whole y sub p usual. I'm going to write it out. a sub k x to the k plus a sub k minus 1. If you want to zoom forward 10 or 15 seconds, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> I won't say anything super important in this next 10 or 15 seconds. So plus a sub 1x plus a sub 0 e to the minus x cosine x plus b sub k x to the k plus b sub k minus 1 x to the k minus 1 plus dot 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 plus b1 x plus b0 e to the minus x sine of x and brackets. So we multiply y sub p usual by the smallest power that such that when we after we do that, and if we were to distribute that power through, none of the y sub p would be any part of y sub h. If we were to carry that that power x, that power x right here in through the oops let's do this in through the the cosine factor we would not have a sub zero e to the minus x cosine we would have a sub zero x e to the minus x cosine and that is not part of y sub h so it is possible then we could find a non zero we could find a, a constant a sub zero to contribute to y sub p and the same thing for carrying that x through to the sine portion. When we do that, we will no longer have b sub 0 e to the minus x sine of x, that, that part that is part of y sub h. And we can find our constants, a, a zero, a, uh, all these constants. We would determine the constants um, by substituting y sub p back into our differential equation. It would be a nightmare and a half for the general case. If you notice that, that we'd have to be we'd have to use the product rule a whole bunch of times, we'd have a, a whole bunch of terms. So this is that's why I'm just setting up the 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 um, form for y sub p. Um, when I have you do this on a test, I'm I may or may not have you uh, solving for the actual constants. For mostly I'm interested in you finding the, the usual form, or not the usual form, the, the form for y sub p. Um, so if, if I do this on a test uh, and I actually want you to find the constants, it, you won't be looking for a system of 99 <laughs> equations and 99 unknowns. I promise. Okay, so um, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at another example here. We're almost done. Let's take a look at another example. The method actually flows pretty quickly. You probably don't believe me right now, which is, I, I wouldn't blame you. The method actually flows very quickly in practice. Um, description of the method takes all this time because there's so many different details that can occur, but this really flows nicely in practice. So let's see. Here's our differential equation. y double prime minus 4y prime plus 4y equals 7 e to the 2x y sub h. Auxiliary equation lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 4 equals 0. Factor 
lambda minus 2 times another lambda minus 2 equals 0. Lambda equals 2 is a 0 of multiplicity 2. And that had kind of significance in our, our last section. So without the multiplicity of 2, we, we would expect e to the 2x in y sub h. Since we have a multiplicity of 2, we expect that e to the 2x and also an x e to the 2x. Okay, so there's our y sub, y sub h by our method of the last section. So y sub p, y sub p, the forcing function is 7e to the 2x. So the 7e to the 2x is our forcing function. So the usual form of y sub p, let's say y sub p usual, one of these days I'm going to learn how to spell usual. Oops. Y sub p, oops, 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 usual would be a e to the 2x. This can't work because a e to the 2x is exactly the first part of y sub h. So no matter what we put substitute for a, we're going to get zero when we substitute y sub p into the, this form of y sub p into the um, differential equation, and we need to get 7 e to the 2x. So, um, if we multiply, if we multiply y sub p usual by x, if we multiply y sub p usual by x, will this work? And the answer is no. The answer is no because this form of y sub p is exactly what the second term in y sub h is. And no matter what we select for this, the constants, constant a in this form of y sub p, this, uh, this y sub p will always give us 0 when we substitute it into the differential equation, and we need 7e to the 2x. So... Remember what I said earlier about um, uh, this adjustment. We multiply the usual y sub p by the smallest power of x so that no part of that resulting y sub p is any part of the original y sub h. If we multiply by x squared instead of x, then none of the result, none of none of y sub p will be any part of y sub h. So if we multiply x squared times a e to the 2x, we'll get a x squared e to the 2x. And we're guaranteed that if we substitute this y p into the differential equation, we will not get zero. Because the only way we can get a zero result is if we substitute y sub h c1 e to the 2x plus another constant c2 x e to the 2x x squared e to the 2x will give us our y sub p okay so that's how we make our adjustment um i have one more very quick example to to show you and i, I assure you it goes very very quickly but i want to i want to show you a, a bit of a difference between uh, my explanation of that that uh power of x adjustment for y sub p uh, compared to the author's explanation. So my explanation, my explanation says that you multiply, you multiply uh, y sub p usual by x to the m where m is the smallest um, integer, uh, whole number. Integers can be negative, and we don't allow that. Whole number. 
such that no part of y sub p is no part of y sub p is any part of y sub h. This adjustment is very, very simple. Your author's explanation, it works just as well. Your author says that you multiply uh, y sub p. He doesn't call it usual, but I will. You multiply y sub p usual by x to the m, where m is the multiplicity. Multiplicity of the z of the root of p of lambda equals zero. So train your eyes up a little bit. When we were finding y sub h, we found that the multiplicity of the, the root 2 was 2. So your author says that that multiplicity, let me actually do this. He says that that multiplicity, that multiplicity, um, is the power that you use to adjust oops, uh, the usual form of y sub h, uh, y sub p. So it says it was 2, multiplicity 2, we multiply by the usual form of y sub p by 2. If it were multiplicity 5, we would multiply by x to the fifth. Okay? All right. One more quick example, and you guys can uh, dig into dig into homework or take a break okay so um suppose we have a differential equation y double prime minus 4y prime this will go very quickly guaranteed plus 4y equals 7e to the 2x um so this in fact that's the, the previous differential equation but it also has minus 2 thirds x squared sine 4x for the forcing function. Okay, y sub h we already found. y sub h we already found above. It's the same left-hand side as the, the example we just looked at. So y sub h equals c1 e to the 2x plus c2 x e to the 2x. Okay, so y sub p. <clears throat> Since our forcing function has 7e to the 2x, the same 7e to the 2x as we had before, um, we're going to get, as a contribution from that, let's say y sub p1, that particular solution that we just formed, the ax squared e to the 2x. And I'll even write it as uh, x squared the adjustment factor times a e to the 2x, just like before. We also have a second cont contribution to our uh, y sub p from the from the sine term. Now notice these two these two parts of the forcing terms in the forcing functions are terms. They're not they're not a product. They're not a factors. These, these we're, we're subtracting these two things. So y sub p2, we form independently of 7e to the minus 2x. We form it just looking at the 2 thirds, negative 2 thirds equal, uh, x squared e sine x. It has a power of x squared. So we expect a power of x squared to be in the particular solution. So a, well, let's say a2x squared plus a1x plus a sub 0. We expect cosine. We also expect sine. b2x squared and the corresponding power, b1 
x plus b0 uh, sine for x. Now, for y sub p1, this was our adjustment that we made. We adjusted the, the usual form in the last example by multiplying by x squared. We don't need to adjust y sub p2. So y sub p is going to be that adjusted, oops, let's do it this way to make it real clear. It's going to be y sub p1 plus y sub p2, where y sub p1 was the adjusted y sub p1 usual plus we don't multiply we don't adjust uh, y sub p2 so the final result is that y sub p takes on the form ax squared e to the 2x plus y sub p2 and I'll write it out a sub 2x squared plus a sub 1x plus a sub 0 cosine 4x yep. plus b sub 2x squared plus b sub 1x plus b sub 0 sine 4x. Okay, and that ends our lecture on section 4.3. I look forward to talking with you again soon.